And we are interested in understanding what happens to phi when you restrict some nice subregion of your fundamental domain. And the other side of it, the holomorphic side, is you want to think of modular forms of weight k. Again, normalized so that their L2 norm is 1. So here the L2 norm is 1. And we want to ask exactly the same question. Now as uh, k goes to infinity, sorry, if you restrict to a compact set C, does this again go to area of C over pi over 3? And so, so this side, the case of mass forms is what uh, Manfred will be talking about, and I'll be talking entirely about this other case, the case of polymorphic forms. And in both cases, we'll see that there's, a, there's an important role to be played by, by Hecker operators, which is kind of uh, where I stopped last time. Uh, the Hecker operators are particularly nice to define in the, in the mass form case. So let me just tell you what those are. Let's say for a prime P, the Hecker operator TP is going to be you take your mass form and you write something like 1 over square root of p times uh, uh, phi of uh, pz plus the sum over phi of z plus b over p. b goes from 0 to p minus 1. Okay. You, can, you can define the heck operators for every integer n. You can also define it by taking this weight k into account it's just a little bit more complicated. This is particularly nice to write down, so let's just think about this. And, uh, and you can choose, in both cases, you want to choose phi and f to be eigenfunctions for all the Hecker operators. Okay. Now, in the mass form case, uh, Manfred has been talking about how you actually do something else. You're not studying the function phi on the surface. So in the mass form case, there is a lift of phi to, to some phi tilde, which lives on SL2z mod SL2r. So he began describing what this lift is, and he's going to probably finish it next time. But this was a, this is a very interesting construction where you lift it to a function which which begins which is invariant under the geodesic flow, and then you can get started with the with the dynamics approach. So there's a difference in the holomorphic case. Is that we don't know how to define such a microlocal lift. Um, it's not clear how to do this. Maybe there is one, but so far people haven't found a nice way of getting something out of here, which lifts to the to the unit tangent bundle and which it becomes uh, invariant under the geodesic flow. So in other words, you can't. So somehow we don't know how to use the techniques that uh, that Elon has to to deal with the holomorphic form case. Now conversely. The techniques that work for the, the holomorphic form case don't actually work for the mass form case. So, so it's kind of nice that the methods are very different and they each work in one case, but not so far in the other. So I want to first explain to you what is the different input in the holomorphic form case, which we don't have for mass form. So, so let's uh, think about the Hecker operator, TP. You can see that it's a, it's a sum of uh, P plus one numbers. So uh, it's a sum of phi at pz and also phi at uh, these translations z plus, uh, actually that's not quite right. It should have been 
uh, z over p plus b over p, right? So, so z plus p, b all over p. So, so you, if you like, you can think of it as a as a random walk. You start at your point z, and then you either go to p times z, or you go to one of these points z, z over p, z plus one over p, etc. But you are averaging over p plus one point. So the fact that I've normalized it by dividing by square root of t is suggesting that there's a lot of cancellation in this walk, that this walk kind of mixes very quickly. Uh, you, uh, and this is not at all an obvious thing. So, so let me put it this way. So suppose, suppose phi is a mass form, which is an eigenfunction of all heck operators. What can I say about the pth heck eigenvalue? So let me call that lambda phi of p. What can I say about the size of this? Well, here's what I can do. I can pick the value of z for which phi of z is the largest. Then the, the left-hand side would be just the eigenvalue lambda of p times uh, the largest value that phi takes. On the right-hand side, everything else that you see is going to be smaller than the largest value, phi of pz, et cetera. So it's clear that this is going to be less than 1 over square root of p times the p plus 1 points that I have. So it's something like square root of p plus 1 over square root of p. So this is kind of a trivial bound for these, uh, for these Hecke eigenvalues. But much more is expected to be true. These are the Ramanujan conjectures. So which says that, in fact, the lambda phi of p is uh, less than 2 for all p. Okay. One way to write it is that I can write these, write these eigenvalues as something like alpha p plus beta p. And I can choose it so that alpha p times beta p is 1. And then the conjecture is that both alpha p and beta p are of size 1. So, so this, this way of writing is, uh, uh, you can see that the trivial bound that I have says that alpha p and beta p are both smaller than square root of p in size, but really you want them to be of size 1. So, so this conjecture is, uh, is open in the mass form case. Except that we have we have progress towards this uh, towards this conjecture. We know things like the pth Fourier coefficient or the pth Hecke eigenvalue would be bounded by some power of p, uh, which is pretty small. I, I think this is right, but okay, maybe something like this: seven over sixty-four plus epsilon. Okay, so. It's pretty small, but it's certainly not as small as, uh, as p to the epsilon, or, or as small as 2. But in the, in the holomorphic form case, this is a famous theorem of Deligne. And we do have the Ramanujan conjectures. So in this case, if I denote the Hecke eigenvalue for um, a holomorphic form f by lambda f, f of p, then this is smaller than, than 2. Okay. So at the moment, I haven't said why this is useful. But, uh, but in, the, in the proof that I'm going to present you to, due to Holowinski and me, uh, in both our arguments, we use very heavily the fact that we know the Ramanujan conjecture for, for holomorphic forms. And if we knew this for the mass form case, we would, have, we would also have the corresponding result of QED for mass forms. But, but that's, uh, that's kind of a big if. One other difference between the two techniques is that uh, the approach to holomorphic forms will allow you to compute some rate 
at which you are converging to the equidistribution measure. So as k goes to infinity, you can say that, you can say how rapidly you're getting equidistributed. So far in the ergodic approach, it's difficult to compute rate. I mean, it's, I don't think that there should be any reason why we can't, but I think nobody, nobody has done it, so, as far as I can tell. Okay, so now let me say something about how the proof of this will, will go. So here's our, so here's our fundamental domain. And we have some nice set C inside here. And I want to understand what proportion of F lies inside C. Okay, so I'm kind of trying to look at the function chi of C, which is the characteristic function of the set C. So it's just one if your point is in C and zero otherwise. Now, you don't really want to just think about this. You might think of some, you know, some smooth version of that. Which just means that, you know, you don't want to, you don't want to just have something one and zero, but, you know, just uh, smooth it at the boundary, say, at the edges. So in other words, what we want to, what we want to say is that I want to look at, uh, I want to look at any nice function. So nice means, you know, maybe smooth uh, of compact support, say. Some nice smooth function, uh, let's call it G, which lives on, on gamma mod H. And I'm interested in integrating over the full fundamental domain of g of z times the measure that I'm interested in y to the k times mod f of z squared dx dy over y squared. So f is a weight k Hecke eigenform. Okay, and in this setting, all I want is that this should go to this should go to three over pi times just the integral of, of G. This is uh, re just rewriting the conjecture that we, that we want to prove. Okay. Now, of course, I don't have to prove this for every choice of a nice function G. I could write down a basis for all the functions of which are smooth and of compact support, let's say, on, on the space. And I just have to prove it for every function in my basis. So need this for. A nice basis. So I'm going to tell you two ways in which we can think of what a nice basis would be, and then how those two, those two approaches lead to two different sets of problems. Um, we have one approach in one, for one basis and another approach for the other basis. And uh, neither approach actually works, but they work together. So, uh, okay, so here they are. So first I want to take a, a spectral decomposition of functions on gamma mod h. And the second approach will be through what are called incomplete Eisenstein and Poincare series. So let me explain what these are. So even though I'm in the in the holomorphic case, I will actually need mass forms again because uh, I am interested in, in weight zero functions on, on gamma mod H. So if I want to take a spectral expansion, the spectral theorem tells me that every function G can be decomposed into 
the inner product of G with a constant function, which is square root of three over pi times uh, square root of three over pi times the inner product of G with, with mass forms phi j. So phi j is, a, is an orthonormal basis of mass forms. You might as well assume that these are these mass forms are also eigenfunctions of all the Hecker operators. So uh, among all the mass forms, if there are any of a given eigenvalue, you can decompose that space into, into the Hecker eigenforms of that space. And then thirdly, you have some kind of, so this will be a sum over these, over these objects. And then thirdly, you will have some integral of the inner product of G with Eisenstein series. On the half line with these Eisenstein series. <clears throat> now, I, I kind of mentioned this uh, last time when I said that you should think of the spectral expansion as being uh, as taking a, a Fourier transform in some sense and taking a Fourier series in, in this uh, for the mass forms. Now, you will know that if you take a Let's say you take a smooth function on the circle and you take its Fourier series, then the Fourier series will have, uh, the Fourier coefficients will be rapidly decreasing. So if it's uh, k times differentiable, if your function is k times differentiable, your Fourier coefficients will decrease like one over n to the k. Okay. And the proof of this is, uh, is what uh, Manfred did last time. It's integration by parts. So you, you, you take, you take f, you know, product with your, with your, uh, with your exponential and you just, differentiate by parts and then you have f prime with your uh, with your exponential except that now you save an n and you repeat it over and over again you can do the same thing here let me just uh, explain maybe what you can do here suppose you take the laplacian delta and you apply delta g so sorry suppose you'd start with g phi j that's the same as if lambda j is the eigenvalue of phi j, this is one over lambda j times g and delta phi j. But you do your integration by parts a couple of times. So you then take this delta over to g because the Laplacian is self-adjoint. So this is one over lambda j times delta g phi j. You assume that your function g was smooth. So differentiating it, you know, it makes it a little bit more complicated, but it's not it doesn't depend upon phi at all. It just depends upon what G is doing. So you do this over and over again. So you could write this as one over lambda J squared times delta squared G phi J, et cetera, et cetera. Exactly as for, exactly as for Fourier series, you know, you can prove that uh, the Fourier coefficient of a function F would be basically integrating F prime and then dividing it by two pi i n. So now you can see that these numbers just depend upon g. They don't depend upon the eigenvalue lambda. So I can get it to be any con some constant, any constant that I want depending upon g times any power of the eigenvalue that I want. So this is less than some constant which depends only on g and any number k that I want. Well, let's say l divided by any power of the eigenvalue lambda j to the l. So what this means is that if I have a smooth function and I'm expanding it in the spectral, in the spectral expansion, I don't need to worry about what all the mass forms are. It's, it's really going to be weighted heavily towards what happens with the constants, what happens with the first few mass forms, and then it decreases rapidly after that. Okay. These correlations are extremely small once the eigenvalue of phi j is large. And in exactly the same way, if you're worried about whether this integral converges or not, what I've just said is that all these inner products are going to be extremely small. They're going to be smaller than any power of t that you want, one over any power of t that you want. So it's concentrated on t in a, in a small bounded region. And once t is big, it kind of dies away. Is that uh, clear? Yes. So this is a point that, I, that, is, that I'll use Quite heavily. 
So what it means is that if I now want to understand, so I want to understand the equidistribution of of y to the k times mod f squared, then that's equivalent to understanding the inner products of these. With the, the, the with the functions that appear in the spectral expansion, with the constant uh, mass forms and Eisenstein series. Because these these functions span everything that I want, and I only have to understand what happens here. Moreover, when I when I want to understand these. I can assume here that these are mass forms uh, with small eigenvalues. Because if my compact set C is fixed and if the eigenvalue is large, those things are making a very small contribution anyway. And similarly, when I'm interested in the inner product of the Eisenstein series, I'm only interested in this for small values of T. So let me. Okay, so this this is the this is the reduction of the problem. Of course, I don't have to tell you what to do with the constants. If I'm just taking this measure, integrating on the full fundamental domain with a constant, I'm just going to pick up the constant. Okay. So so this part is easy. We don't have to do anything with it. And what we have to prove. So in other words, the problem is to show. Is to show that if I take a fixed mass form on phi j, and I take the inner product that this goes to zero. Okay, so we have to be careful of exactly how we do this. So the mass form phi j is considered fixed and k goes to infinity. Okay, so I'm not stating this for k fixed and phi j and the eigenvalue going to infinity, it's the, it's the other way around. And similarly, for a fixed value of t, I want to show that this is the, the, the integral of this with an Eisenstein series. That this goes to zero as well. So what I've written down should be familiar to you in a, in a different context. This is really just the idea behind uh, Weyl's equidistribution theorem. Okay. So imagine you have a you have a bunch of, uh, you have a sequence of numbers, and you want to understand whether they're uniformly distributed mod 1. Then Weyl's equidistribution theorem says, well, I want to understand how many of them lie in an interval. You decompose that interval by taking a Fourier expansion. Say, so you smooth the interval out and take a Fourier expansion. If you smooth it, you only need to look at the first few Fourier coefficients. And then you want to say that the constant, the constant term is going to give you the main term that you expect, that the number of uh, values of your sequence lying in an interval is proportional to the length of the interval. And then you want to show that every other free, every other uh, exponential cancels out when you evaluate along your sequence. Okay. So that's why it's a distribution criterion. And what I've written down for you is the exact analog of this in this context. Okay, so that's that's one way of approaching this problem. So that's one basis for for this uh, uh, for functions living on gamma mod h. So now let me describe the second basis.
So, so here's what I want to do. So I have, and then I have some nice set here. Okay. Now, you know, it could be that the set lies around this arc, but okay, let's uh, let's just think of this in a in a in a nice picture here. So, so what I want to do is, I can I can think of this guy. You know, if I draw a line, a horizontal line at height y, right? So then, then what do I want to find uh, as a function of x? So I want to think of the characteristic function of this set, set c. And uh, if I fix y, then what I get is a periodic function in x. With period one, right? I mean, the periodic function is just going to be the function in x, which is uh, zero everywhere except on this small segment of the interval, where it's going to be one. Okay. So, so now I have for every fixed value of x, I have a function in x which is periodic with period one. So I can take the Fourier expansion of that function. And then I can put everything you know, in y. After I do this for one y, I can do it for a different value of y, et cetera, et cetera. So I kind of separate variables in x and y like so. So you can take, expand this into a Fourier series. Okay, this idea is, uh, is very old. So you would have seen, you may have seen this in some context. This is the theory of what I call uh, Eisenstein and Poincare series. Maybe you would have seen this in a, in a holomorphic context. Maybe that will be more familiar to you. But in the, in the, in the non-holomorphic context, it might be even easier to think about. I, I just think of some function psi which is uh, smooth from zero to infinity to uh, maybe zero to infinity to to r or c, let's say c. And what I want to do is I want to think of uh, the imaginary part of so so this is going to be a function of this uh, this fibering y, okay. And so I'm going to sum the imaginary part of gamma z. And take psi of that, so that's psi of y, and average this with an exponential and sum over all gamma and in gamma infinity mod gamma. So this is going to be my mth Poincare series. Okay, so. So if you want to think, so, so what does this mean? All it means, so this, this idea of averaging over the whole group, right, basically means that I'm restricting myself to a fundamental domain here, okay? Gamma infinity means that is the, is these period, is, are these upper triangular matrices N and Z, and that's just to make sure, you know, I have something periodic, so I don't want to sum it over all the, translations by an integer, otherwise I'll just get something infinite. So I want to be sure to mod out by that. But apart from that, this, this thing is really just counting what I told you here. If you take m equals zero, so if in the case m equals zero, I get something called the, the incomplete Eisenstein series Ez psi, which is just the sum of psi of imaginary part of gamma z overall gamma and gamma infinity mod gamma. So, so in this case, you know, you could you could imagine that what uh, what the Eisenstein series is doing is that let's say I'm interested in picking out some block of uh, values of y. Let's say y lies between one and two. I want to understand the characteristic function of this. I can just write it in terms of this Eisenstein series because that doesn't depend upon x. It's just period. It's just a constant in x, and it just is a function on y. So I can rewrite it in terms of just this Eisenstein series like so. If you had a more complicated thing where 
the dependence on x is something more complicated, you can use the sines and cosines, the higher sines and cosines to pick that up. And that's what leads to these Poincare series. Okay, so, so please do stop me if, uh, if something gets confusing. It's just a sum. Oh no, E is for Eisenstein. Oh, the, the, oh, I don't know. If, if you want a comma there instead of a line, that's okay. Okay. So, yeah, I don't know why I wrote this. Okay, so, so then the result is, so if M equals zero, you get these Eisenstein series. Uh, and the result again is that every nice function on on gamma mod h can be can be spanned in terms of a sum of a sum over these Poincare series. With some coefficients. Okay. And you might have to choose your function c nicely. You're free to choose your function psi as well. Okay, and the proof is just what I've told you. It just amounts to taking a Fourier expansion. Separate the variables and take Fourier expansion. Okay, so those are kind of the, the two approaches. So now, so here, oh, let me finish off what we want to show here. So, so here the problem becomes, is uh, you fix a function fix psi and so a you could fix a number m which is not equal to zero so in this case the Poincare series are genuinely Poincare series they're, they span the cuspidal space so their their integral along every horizontal line is zero and in this case what you want to say is that if you take the integral over h mod gamma that this goes to zero. Again, this is the analog of uh, Weil's criterion. And then if you look at the case m equals zero, where you have Eisenstein series, so here you want to go, there's, there is an actual uh, number that you should converge to, it's simply going to be uh, three over pi times the integral over gamma mod h. So because this should converge to three over pi dx dy over y squared of e z psi. So again, I will call this uh, Wilde's criterion. Now, so let me put back uh, what we had from the from the spectral expansion, and each one of these uh, equivalent criteria leads to a leads to a completely different set of problems. So the first one is connected to to L functions, and the second one is connected to something called uh, shift, the shifted convolution problem. And, uh, and there are two different approaches to each one of these that I'll describe in the next two lectures. Okay, so let me first begin by telling you about uh, about the, the spectral approach. So let's take uh, let's take first what happens in the inner product with Eisenstein series. That's a little bit easier to understand, and then we'll have to take as a block black box what happens in the inner product with, uh, with cusp forms, which is much harder. So, so imagine you have an Eisenstein series EZS. So by the way, you know, the two Eisenstein series are kind of uh, different from each other. 
This EZS, let me recall for you, was taken by, was looking at gamma infinity mod gamma. You take imaginary part of gamma Z and you raise it to the power S, at least when the real part of S is bigger than one. This makes sense. And then you analytically continue to the half line. Okay, that was the spectral Eisenstein series. The incomplete Eisenstein series was defined this other way with this, with this function C. You could ask, what is the relation between the two? Well, it is what you would think. Uh, you can take any incomplete Eisenstein series and you can write it as an integral over all these, over these uh, spectral Eisenstein series. Okay. So the spectral theorem that I, that I gave, uh, gave a decomposition of any nice function into, into inner products with cusp forms, mass cusp forms and Eisenstein series. The incomplete Eisenstein series are spanned by the spectral Eisenstein series. The Poincare series are spanned by all the mass forms. That's the cuspidal space. Okay, so if you start with, with the region real part of S bigger than one, then we can make progress on the inner product of the Eisenstein series. This is a very familiar technique. This is the rankin selberg unfolding method. So you have, so you start with real part of S bigger than one. Y squared, you write down the, the, the definition of EZS, so you get an integral over gamma mod H as sum over all gamma and in, gamma infinity mod gamma. And then you get y to the k mod f of z squared, uh, imaginary part of gamma z to the s, d mu z. Let me call this measure d mu z, which is invariant under the action of SL2R and therefore also of SL2Z. So the way I rig this, this object y to the k f of z squared is invariant under the action of SL2Z by the fact that you have a modular form. So this is uh, imaginary part of gamma z to the k mod f of gamma z squared. Then you have an imaginary part of gamma z to the s and then d mu gamma z. Okay. And, uh, and then if I just uh, make a change of variable, so then I get a sum over all gamma in gamma infinity mod gamma. I make a change of variable replacing gamma z by z throughout, and then I'll have to integrate on the image of this fundamental domain by, by gamma. And now I can add up what happens with all the fundamental domains. So I choose a representative for each uh, coset of gamma infinity mod gamma. So when I sum this over all those cosets, I just get an integral over a fundamental domain for gamma infinity mod h of y to the k mod f of z squared. And now this is easy because uh, a fundamental domain for gamma infinity mod h, gamma infinity are just the translations by one. So if I look at the, if I look at a fundamental domain for gamma infinity mod h, that's just this region from say zero to one and then y going from one, zero to infinity. So, so this integral would be an integral over uh, y goes from zero to infinity, y to the k plus s, uh, dy over y squared, and then there's an integral over x goes from 0 to 1 squared. Okay, so now you can work out what this is by, by Parseval. Okay, so now let me just recall for you, maybe I should have done this before. Uh, F was chosen to be a Hecke eigenform. What that means is that you can write down a Fourier expansion for F.
and it looks like f of z is given by a sum over n goes from 1 to infinity. Uh, these coefficients, these are the Hecke eigenvalues lambda of n. The way I normalized it, there was an n to the k plus 1 over 2 in my definition of the Hecke operators. That puts an n to the k minus 1 over 2. These coefficients lambda of n by Deligne's theorem are bounded by a divisor function. They're bounded by 2 on, on the primes. And then here I have e to the 2 pi i n z. That's my Fourier expansion, uh, except that I normalized my f so that it's L2 norm is 1. That's the same as saying I multiply it by some constant. C is some constant. Okay, constant means constant in terms of f, right? So C is some, some function of f, which is chosen to normalize the L2 norm to be 1. And then if I write out what this is, uh, I get if for the for the for the integral for the sum of uh, uh, f of x plus i y squared, I get something like c squared. The sum over n goes from one to infinity, lambda f n squared, n to the k minus one, uh, e to the minus four pi n y by by parcel over here, and then I get. Call this star. It's the integral from zero to infinity, y to the k plus s, dy over y squared. Okay, this is kind of a familiar calculation. You can also recognize that when you do the integral over y, you will pick up some kind of gamma function. So, so this is some nice object. It's uh, it's some gamma functions times uh, times basically the series lambda f n squared over n to the s, which is called the rankin selberg L function. Okay, so, okay, I didn't uh, do this you know, in complete detail, but I wrote down the answer in the in the notes, so you can kind of see. So this was all done for the real part of s bigger than one, but then by analytic continuation, you have the same formula for s equals half plus i t, and you plug this in at half plus i t. So what you need to know is that this rankin selberg l function actually factorizes as two things. It factorizes as, uh, as zeta of s times another l function, which is called the symmetric square l function. Well, properly, I should probably call it the adjoint L function of f, but it's the same in this case as the symmetric square L function. Okay. So the upshot of it, if you look at the if you look at a formula in the notes, is that I can compute the inner product. So. I can compute the inner product of uh, y to the k mod fz squared with my Eisenstein series ez half plus it. And I have, you know, what you could call a nice formula for this. It will be given in terms of, uh, if you exactly work out what it is, it's uh, something in terms of some powers of pi. And some gamma factors, which you have to work out what they are, and it gives you this. Okay, this is not exactly what was on the page before, but let me explain what is different from this and, uh, and what I had. One thing you would notice is that there was this normalization constant c squared, which has kind of disappeared in this, uh, in this expression that I wrote down. And the reason for it is that you can compute what the normalization constant c squared is, it will turn out to be something like gamma of k, which will involve gamma of k, and this L1 symmetric square of the symmetric square function. Okay. And what is L1 sim squared f? I, I wrote to you, I said before that lambda f of p could be written as alpha p plus beta p 
where alpha p, beta p is one. And, uh, and in fact, we also know that the size of alpha p and beta p is one, although we don't need it for what I'm going to write down. The, the L function of the function of the modular form f itself would be something which looks like the sum of lambda f n over n to the s, which will have an Euler product, like an Euler product for the zeta function, but having two terms now. Overall primes, and this more complicated object, the symmetric square L function of f, would be something which has three Euler products, so one minus alpha p squared over p to the s inverse, times one minus alpha p times beta p, which is also equal to one. Over p to the s inverse. Okay, and we know lots of properties for this. We know that this uh, has an analytic continuation. And a nice functional equation, etc. So, so this is stuff that's just known thanks to the work of uh, Shimura, and uh, well, first it was proved by Shimura, and then there's a lot more work on this. Okay. I'll, I'll kind of explain a little bit more what these L functions are and what they, uh, and how we should think about this later. So for the moment, let me point out, okay, so, so we have, so what I want to point out is that we have some kind of formula for what this, uh, what the inner product with Eisenstein series is going to be. And then we have to just prove that whatever you see in this formula is going to zero for fixed values of t and as k goes to infinity, okay? So, so if you think of t as being fixed, I can forget about these uh, zeta of half plus it and zeta of one plus two it. t is fixed, I guess I should assume that t is not equal to zero, otherwise I have some problems here. Actually, I don't have a problem. It will be infinite on the down, so it will be zero. Okay, so it will be okay if t is zero. Uh, but so, so, so I'll forget about all these zetas, and morally what I have, if I plug in Stirling's formula for gamma, I get something like one over square root of k. That's gamma of k minus half over gamma of k. And then what I really have is the symmetric square L function at half plus it. divided by L1 of the symmetric square function. And we would like to know that this goes to zero as uh, k goes to infinity. So there are two things that you would like to know if you want to make this bound. One is you want a, an upper bound for the numerator, and then you want a lower bound for the denominator. And then we'll be done. Okay, so, so let me start with the, with the second case. This is not, you know, this is something which should give you a little bit of pause because uh, even if I take something like Dirichlet L functions and I ask you to give a lower bound for Dirichlet L functions at the, at the point one, this is kind of problematic because this is related to getting lower bounds for the class numbers. We don't have very good lower bounds for class numbers. You know, we have Ziegel's theorem, which would give ineffectively that say L1 chi is bounded by Q to the minus epsilon, where if, if you have a character chi mod Q. But fortunately, life is a little bit better here. We actually know, thanks to uh, Hofstein and Lockhart and uh, Goldfels, Lehman, Hofstein, Lehman. That there is kind of a nice lower bound for this. L1 sin squared f is bounded below by some constant divided by log k. Okay. So, so now if we know that the upper bound for the denominator, if it's better than, than square root of k over log k, then we are done. Right? So if it goes to zero compared to square root of k over log k. 
Okay, so now I can tell you what the problems are. There is actually a way to bound these L values. It's, uh, it's fairly easy and it's called a convexity bound. And as luck would have it, the convexity bound for L half plus IT sim squared F is exactly K squared, it's exactly square root of K. Okay. So, so it cancels out the one over square root of K that we have, um, except that you know we don't know that this constant, this this L one sum squared F is actually big, so we can't. Uh, so, okay, so this barely fails. Right? So, uh, you haven't shown that something goes to zero. You've only shown that it's smaller than log K, if you like. There is something called a subconvexity problem. Which is which says that L half plus IT sum squared F is bounded by K to the half minus minus delta for any delta that you like. So delta could be 10 to the minus 12, you would still be okay. If you can prove this with delta is 10 to the minus 12, then you know that again it's going to go to zero. But unfortunately, this is uh, this is still open. Uh, it's also the generalized Riemann hypothesis. So, which says that all the zeros for this, this L function, the symmetric square L function, lie on the half line. And that would prove that, in fact, L half plus IT sim squared F is bounded by K to the epsilon. Okay. So, of course, this would be very nice because this would show that you do go to zero. And, in fact, you go to zero at kind of an optimal rate. It goes to zero pretty rapidly, like 1 over square root of K. So, okay, so I should say this is also open, so like the subconvexity problem. Uh, but, okay, so, so there is some connection to at least a, a set of problems which were studied before, which would have impact on this problem. Uh, I have to tell you that the same thing holds for the inner product with mass form, so I'll explain that, that next time. And then I'll explain what we know towards the, sub the subconvexity problem 